actually food. So last story in the book, there is a woman who we met in the 1940s when she was uh, a teenager whose uh, brother has just married this young woman and she and the young woman have a torrid um, thing in the middle of the night for several nights. Um, but then, you know, she's married and she goes off with the brother. So this is now 60 years later. And uh, various things have happened, but I'm just reading a cooking scene. Mungai pauses before starting the second dish. She undoes the top of her sari, pulling the loose end of the fabric back over her shoulder, down across her breasts. She tucks it into her waistband, leaving her upper body covered only in her thin white blouse, less constricted. It will be easier to cook this way, though that's not why she does it. She chops three more onions, chops them finely this time. As they saute, she sets eight eggs to boiling. They'll be ready when the sauce is finished. Timing again. Cumin and mustard seed, but this time only turmeric and salt are added. The onions cook gently, caramelizing, filling the room with their sweet scent. Nothing to make her choke. Eggs should be sweet and slick. They should slide down your throat as delicate and ephemeral as honey. She had made eggs for those bridal breakfasts. She'd watched Sundar's bride swallow them greedily, the muscles of her slender throat shivering down. Mungai had made eggs every morning for the pleasure of that throat. The onions have almost burned. She must pay closer attention. Nothing can be made perfect without the closest of attention. That's one of the first lessons. It's important to understand that onions cannot be allowed to burn for even five seconds. The slightest burn will coat the dish with an aftertaste that no amount of chili powder can disguise. Once things have started going bad, they're forever changed. There's no going back to that perfect moment, the one that could have been, although sometimes there may be a going forward. Burnt food has its own flavor. Sometimes you can work with it, make it into something else that is, at least, interesting. But that's not her current goal. Today, she's creating perfection and the memory of it to savor. She pours cold water over the cooked eggs. She cracks their shells, slices them into the yellow sauce. She scatters golden sultanas over the top and slivered almonds. This dish will keep well. She turns a plate over it and sets it aside. She stirs the potatoes. They are half done, and so is she. Pause there on that one. Um, if you're hungry, there are Sri Lankan sweets over there. Please, like, maybe you could grab them, pass them around. There's milk toffee and marshmallows. Eat, eat. You're too skinny, right? Like so. Um, so it's it's funny. I was I was in grad school doing an MFA when I started writing these stories, and the first time I um, workshopped one, I had a Jewish classmate, and she's like, "It's exactly the same, right?" Like it's you know there are many immigrant similarities in community. Okay, um, I also pass around some more of the little cards that have photos from the book. Um, the, the book was funded through a Kickstarter, so all the Kickstarter people have essentially pre-ordered. We're going to open up to pre-orders soon. It will be then available at fine bookstores everywhere. Um, we're doing an ebook trade paperback, which won't have photos to keep the cost down, but you'll get it linked to an archive of the photos, and then a beautiful full-color glossy um, hardcover edition. So, all right. Um, and one thing that's really interesting about Sri Lanka is, you know, it's an island that was at the crossroads of trade routes, right? So when you think about the food, um, it is, people ask me, like, what's characteristic of Sri Lankan food? And it's a complicated answer. But one thing that's characteristic is that it's a blend. It is like this and this and this and this all came together. So like that milk toffee is a good example. I think of it as like, Everyone makes it in Sri Lanka. It's like a super common classic dish. All my aunties make it. They all argue about the right way to do it. I'm like OCD enough that I took my auntie's recipe and then I made it over and over with a candy thermometer so that I could write down the exact temperatures. And all my aunties were a little horrified, right? Like, but <laughs> this way it won't burn. So, um, but uh, but the interesting thing for me about it is I went to New Orleans and I had pralines and I'm like, this is exactly the same. It is exactly the same candy except with pecans instead of cashews and you know Sri Lanka was colonized by um, the Dutch the Portuguese and the British and they all brought their influences right and then people from all over the place came through so um, I'm gonna read actually from the book that isn't out yet the, it'll be out hopefully it should be out by this summer and there'll be launch parties and it'll be fun I'll cook it'll be great um, 
I'm going to read you from the introduction. So the first time I started writing a Sri Lankan cookbook, A Taste of Serendib, it was meant simply to be a Christmas present for my mother, writing down some of her recipes. The book offered a few recipes in each book section and featured sketches that a friend drew illustrating me and my mother cooking, including a few choice quotes of my mother scolding me in the kitchen. You cannot read and stir at the same time. Um, I, I'll side note here, because this is a science fiction audience, to note that the artist for those sketches and for the cover of my original cookbook, A Taste of Serendib, um, was Rachel Hartman, who has, at the time I knew her because she was doing this amazing comic, Amy Unbounded, um, which was um, this imaginary land of Goretti and this little girl, Amy, who was having all these adventures with dragons. Well, she went on to then become a fantasy novelist many years later, and her books, uh, Serafina, and I can't, I can't remember all the titles right now, but they're huge in YA lit. Um, they're gorgeous, they're really interesting. So if you like dragons, I encourage you um, to check them out. If you like stories of culture clash and adventurous girls who are trying to navigate a difficult, restrictive culture, um, and maybe changing, and are maybe like part dragon. Um, it's really good. Serafina is amazing. So Rachel Hartman. Anyway, sorry, side note. OK, so that original thing quickly spiraled into a little book, but the focus was still simple, what little I knew of her recipes. It was designed to be accessible to college students, like the one I was at the time. I was an immigrant who had come to America very young, had grown up eating rice and curry every night, but had only a tenuous connection to the food culture of the homeland. My mother had had to make many adaptations when she came to America in 1973. She used ketchup instead of tomatoes, for example, because she didn't have access to coconut milk, and cow's milk didn't have sufficient sweetness. Ketchup also sped along the sauce-making process since it's basically a cooked-down mixture of tomatoes, vinegar, sugar, and salt. My mother's recipes had already changed in America, and as I made them myself, they changed further, adapting to my taste. When I gave my mother the finished book, she was pleased, but also immediately started pointing out where I'd gotten things wrong. For, she really did, like at Christmas, as she's looking at, anyway. Um, for a while, I threatened to do a second edition of the book with Amma's corrections all through it in red. Um, I still think that would have been a good book, but she did not go for it. Um, so the book stayed as it was for many years, and it could have been left there. But instead, more than a decade later, I started working on a new cookbook, A Feast of Serendib. My husband Kevin and I were talking recently about how I choose which projects to work on. There's often a pressure to spend my time and energy on more commercial projects, the ones that have the best odds of a good payout. This new cookbook should sell some copies, but it's hardly the most commercial project I could work on, and making the recipes, some of them over and over and over again, trying to get them right, has been exceedingly time consuming. If it were just about the money, the cookbook would make no sense at all. But it's rarely just about the money. Over the years since I did the first cookbook, I have added more and more Sri Lankan recipes to my repertoire. My cookbook shelf has been overtaken by Sri Lankan cookbooks from classics like the Salon Daily News, to conflict-related books like The Beautiful and Heartbreaking Handmaid, to fancy coffee table books full of glorious photos like The Food of Sri Lanka, to what is still my favorite, Charmaine Solomon's Complete Asian Cookbook. Her Sri Lankan recipes taste like my mother's, like home. I enjoy cooking dishes from other cuisines. Ethiopian is one of my favorites, and there are days when I crave sushi. Pizza is a family standby, and my children are built in large part out of mac and cheese. <laughs> but I come back to Sri Lankan food. I cook it at least once or twice most weeks. These days, I go online and read a dozen different recipes for a dish before I even start making it. I interrogate my Sri Lankan friends, both diaspora and homelander, about their recipes. I want to know how those dishes were typically made in the villages for generations and generations back. What should the balance of salty sour be? How thick do we want the finished gravy? If I can't get a certain leafy green considered key to traditional cookery, I feel such frustration. But I try to accept the truth, that I will likely never cook exactly how homeland Sri Lankans would. My adaptations of my mother's adaptations are still tasty. My husband is white American for enough generations that he's not sure exactly where all his ancestors came from. Once, when Kevin and I were talking about naming our first child, he asked whether we wouldn't be better off if we didn't cling so hard to ethnic, racial, nationalist traditions, divisions in some ways. I think he's right. Sri Lanka was riven by ethnic conflict for decades, and the country and its people are still dealing with the aftermath. Surely, it would be worth giving up much if you could thereby make the conflicts end. But this is who we are. 
This is what it is to be human. We are composed of our mother's hand with a salt shaker, the squeeze of fresh lime at the end of the dish. For those of us who are attenuated from the food of our grandparents and great-grandparents, learning how to cook this food in its many iterations can feel like filling a hole in your heart. So I choose this. I choose to put time and energy into learning this food, into serving it to my mixed race children with the hopes that they will grow to love it too. Kavya comes into the kitchen to ask excitedly, oh, are you making the yellow chicken, the Sri Lankan ginger garlic chicken that she likes better than any other chicken? My heart skips a beat. She's a big fan of puppetum too. We try to teach the children to be loving, to be fair and welcoming to all, whether or not they share our cultural traditions. Can we choose the good parts of our culture to cherish and leave the darker parts behind? We'll see. I make no claim to authenticity. There are many more authentic Sri Lankan cookbooks, painstakingly researched. But if there was a thin line drawn with that first cookbook connecting me to the food of my ancestors, then the last few years of researching and adding recipe after recipe to this cookbook have thickened and strengthened the thread of connection into a sturdy rope, one that you might use when lost to find your way home. I've come to appreciate the long history, the gathered wisdom of a thousand thousand cooks who have known that with the perfection of hoppers at breakfast, all you need is a little fresh coconut sambal to accompany it, with perhaps an egg cracked into the center to steam. The more I cook these recipes, the more I grow to love this food, and I hope other readers of this cookbook will feel the same.